Welcome to BizHack Live, where every Wednesday we talk about some of the latest and greatest in digital marketing for small businesses. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the host as well as the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy, where we train small businesses in how to generate leads and close online sales. Uh, I'm really excited today to welcome Patrick Neff. We'll be talking a little bit more about his amazing background and experience working with Fortune 500 companies in a digital agency and with startups and small businesses. He's gonna to talk today about customer retention. I wanted to acknowledge our partner uh, for today's presentation, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association. I'm really proud that uh, for season three, once a month, uh, South Florida IMA and BizHack have teamed up to deliver amazing digital marketing talent like Patrick today. Uh, I'm very excited, uh, as I'll uh, tell you a little bit more. Next month, we're gonna be featuring a speaker about Clubhouse, the hottest new social media app. And the week after, the month after that, we're gonna be featuring a speaker from Foursquare, uh, one of the granddaddies of location-based marketing. So uh, a really amazing lineup, thanks to South Florida IMA, and thank you to Patrick and to Tom uh, and to the whole team over at the Integrated Marketing Association for partnering with BizHack as their educational partner uh, through BizHack Live. Very happy uh, to be announcing that today. So coming up next week, we're going to be talking about LinkedIn to build your personal brand. This is uh, an issue that a lot of business owners, uh, as well as mid-career folks, have been asking us about and asking for, and Cheryl is one of the best. Uh, the week after that, we're going to be talking about lessons from CE CMO land. So this is going to be giving you a perspective uh, uh, from Tatiana McDaniel, who went from being inside of an agency to going in-house in an e-commerce company and some of the big lessons that she learned in her first year on the job. Uh, after that, I'm going to do my signature uh, lesson on the BizHack lead building system. This is really the foundation of all of our training. Um, it's a system that will allow you to reliably generate leads for your business. This is definitely one that we encourage you to bring friends to, uh, and we definitely want you to help spread the word about because this is really over, over seven years working with 700 businesses. This is the system that we've developed and that we deploy uh, in all of our training. And then finally, we're celebrating the graduation of our latest cohort, uh, cohort 18, uh, the Digital Titans. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to then talk about Clubhouse uh, on March 17th, uh, social media's hottest new platform. It's an audio platform. Uh, it's invite only right now, but it's getting a tremendous amount of attention and buzz, and it is attracting some really uh, interesting opportunities for small businesses, which we're going to explore together with Dennis Yu of Blitz Metrics. Um, if you, so that's a lot to keep track of. Uh, Lilia, if you could put a link to uh, the BizHack 101 at event, dot eventbrite, that's the Clubhouse one. I know a lot of people have been asking for this and we listened. Uh, so if you could put that in the Q&A, uh, I mean, in the chat, uh, go ahead and sign up now, guys. Um, but a lot of folks uh, are saying, you know, we love all of this content. Can we just sign up for all of it at once? And that's what the season pass is about. It's a single convenient way for you to sign up uh, for all of these great uh, par parts of season three and frankly, what we have to come. And it will also uh, help support BizHack Live as a community service so that we can continue to do this long into the future. Thanks to those of you who have bought season passes. Uh, we really appreciate you. One of the other benefits of getting a season pass is you will get an exclusive email after every session with a recording and the presentation and some additional resources. Those are only available to people who've registered for the seminar. Without further ado, I wanted to welcome Patrick Neff. Uh, he works at Southeast Toyota Finance uh, in their marketing and digital experience divisions. He has actually two decades of experience in marketing and he really has developed and carved out, as you'll see, an expertise 
in the customer experience and the digital customer experience and what do you do after you've closed the sale? Um, for many small businesses, this isn't something we spend enough time thinking about and he has spent his entire career thinking about it. And as you'll see in today's presentation, uh, he has a really powerful set of um, strategies and tools that you can use to be a little better at how you uh, create a great customer experience digitally. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Patrick has worked at some of the largest companies in the world, Eli Lilly and John Deere, and he's worked at mid-size and startup companies as well as a marketing agency. And so he really has, I think, that unique perspective of building best practices from the big guys, but then applying them to smaller companies. And uh, without further ado, Patrick Neff, welcome and thank you. Thanks, Dan. Let me uh, give me just a second to uh, get my screen all set up here. Uh, make sure that everybody can see. Are we good to go? Looks great. So thanks for having me, Dan. Uh, uh, the introduction was probably, I hope, hopefully I can live up to the introduction, but uh, we'll see. Uh, as Dan said, I have over, I think it's 23 years experience in marketing, uh, uniquely started in digital. Uh, so this is sort of the backbone of my experience uh, and, and also uniquely started with Eli Lilly building communities to support uh, their Prozac and Lilly diabetes dr drugs back uh, pre-2000. So in that community and relationship building um, sector for, for quite a bit of time. And, and I've certainly done other things. I'm very familiar with customer acquisition um, and all of those traditional marketing strategies, but I've also sort of laid in the principles of retention and sort of that relationship building component throughout my experience. Um, as Dan said, my name is Patrick Neff. I'm the principal manager for marketing and digital experience for Southeast Toyota Finance. And, and we'll just jump right in. So today we're gonna take a look at seven tactics, if you will, that can take, um, that can be used to put more focus on customer experience and drive loyalty and retention. And I know you guys uh, out there are heavily focused on building your business and profitability, and you hear a ton about customer acquisition, and I'm sure people are concerned that we're gonna be saying, hey, you need to stop spending money on acquisition and start spending it on retention. And I'm here to tell you that that isn't the case. Um, you all know that customer acquisition um, is very important and don't worry i'm not here to tell you that you need to shift large financial investments into the customer retention area it's clearly vital to your small business to invest in customer acquisition this isn't about shifting dollars though this is about balancing your focus that, so that you're investing your time and efforts toward retention and what this really does is it fuels um, adds fuel to the fire that you're generating from your acquisition initiatives this, but this isn't an uncommon problem. Research shows that over 40% of companies out there have a much greater focus on customer acquisition than they, are, than they do have on retaining customers. So what are the benefits and what can you expect if you shift some focus to customer retention? Well, customer retention is actually a catalyst to maximize your, your acquisition investment. Everyone has probably heard the stat that it's five times more costly to attract a customer that is a, than it is to retain a customer. But I think it's been said so many times that, that it starts to fall in deaf ears. The other side benefit though to retention is that it's actually been shown to drive greater word, word of mouth references, which is quite honestly the lowest acquisition activity that you can ever have. Not convinced? Here are a few more stats about customer retention. Uh, research from Gartner shows that 65% of companies' revenue come from existing customers, and it's much easier to sell an existing customer because you have a history with them. In fact, data shows that you probably, your probability to sell an existing customer runs between 60 and 70%, while new prospects generally only occur converted at about a 5 to 20% rate. Also note, repeat customers are more profitable. Data shows that they spend about 33% more than a new customer. And Harvard Business School found that due to the growing costs of customer acquisition, as you probably all are aware of, many customer relationships aren't even profitable in the early years of the relationship. 
Now, obviously, some of that depends on what your uh, conversion rates are and how long a customer, uh, the purchase cycle is. At the end of the day, your focus is on profits, right? Only 5% increase in retention can increase your profits by between 25 and 95%. Let's, let's get into our first key, key to success, optimizing your onboarding experience. What is onboarding, you may ask? Onboarding begins the moment that the customer decides they want to try or buy your product or service, and it focuses on setting the tone of the relationship. It's really about controlling your customer's first impressions of you. How does this fit into retention? Well, retention is all about delivering on the brand promise. It's about establishing trust, creating value, and giving the customer a reason to keep doing business with you. A well-onboarded customer is likely to buy as much as 90% more frequently and spend as much as 60% more per transaction. We'll take a few minutes to, key, to the key to proper onboarding. Number one, the more feature rich or complex your product or service is, the more targeted and personalized you need to be with your onboarding activities. Make sure it's simple for the customer though. The user experience needs to be made simple and easy to understand. Optimize the introduction to your product. It's not, re it's not about reviewing all 50 of your great features. It's about cementing the value of the three to five features that attracts the customer in the first place. Keep it simple, and that means keep it short. Humans have a short attention span, so keep your message short and sweet. If you need to break those messages up into small bite-sized pieces, then just do it. The fact of the matter is, if you don't, the customers aren't gonna absorb the information you're provided and you're not going to create the value that you're trying to. Successfully onboarding a customer is about focusing on that customer's reason for purchase. To accomplish this, you need to invest in a way to figure out what that reason was. The function of onboarding is to help shorten a customer's time to value. Let's get practical. Before we dig in on time to value, you guys know your business, your business best, but here are a couple of quick and easy examples on how to take that first step. Make an after purchase call to reinforce the key steps in getting value from your product. If outbound call campaigns are, are not realistic, look at potentially creating an automated email campaign post-purchase post that accomplishes the same goal. At Southeast Toyota Finance, we accomplished this by creating a simple folder that we gave to the dealers to hand out with the contracts. It highlighted the key features on our website and focused on the value a customer could get from paying on the site. One of the small businesses that I consult with, consulted with, which is in the, in the market of uh, medical travel, we built a brochure with them to highlight the features of doing business with them and develop a level of safety and comfort for, for traveling in the country that they're located. Understand time to value and how it impacts customer loyalty. I briefly mentioned time to value before, but let's dig in a little bit. Defined, time to value is the amount of time it takes customers to realize value from your product. There are a variety of phases to realize value, but now, for now, we'll just focus on getting them to phase one value. The focus really is about figuring out how to get the customer to see value more quickly. And the faster you can get them to see that phase one value, the longer they have an optimized value proposition in, during the ownership of the product. A couple of key things to know about time to value. The shorter or the product or service time to benefit purchase, the more important optimizing time to value becomes, especially if your business model relies on recurring revenue. For instance, I spent time managing a software as a service company. We had to generate value quickly because the customer paid on a month to month basis and we could lose a customer, the, all the value that we generated from customer acquisition within 30 days if we didn't see val provide value to the consumer. Faster time to value maximizes the customer, the time a customer engages with your product at a max perceived value and that dramatically increases your chances of repeat purchases 
and can even shorten your time between purchase. Combined, this creates a greater customer lifetime value. In looking at time to value, it's key to focus on the benefit that the specific customer is expecting to receive and not the value you want to deliver. It's really about understanding that customer and their needs and highlighting those needs in a meaningful way. This means you need to have a good understanding of what features and benefits drove the customer's purchase. Focusing on these benefits allows you to key in on the customer's perspective on value. It's worth the time to do the research into what those benefits are. And most important, document them and take action. Let's get practical. If you sell products B2B, provide tools that help them be more productive with their purchase. Um, at one point, I oversaw the marketing strategy for a startup company in the medical equipment business. We actually built what we called uh, businesses in a box where we handed those out with the purchase of the equipment and it gave the end consumer all, all the marketing materials they needed to market the service, those services to the end, their end consumer. If you sell products B2C, provide tips and tricks on how to best use your product. Again, I work with a doctor that does medical tourism down in Costa Rica. We spend a lot of time, effort, and energy educating consumers into the value proposition of working with him as a physician. If you sell a service, make regular check-ins with the customer to make sure that they are seeing value early and often especially if you're in a software and a service uh, business strategy. Number three, we've touched on, on this topic briefly in some of the other areas, but, but it's worth focusing on. When we say understand your customer, it's really about taking the time to understand how, when, and why they chose to use your product and service. That information allows you to make their experience personal. By making it personal, you key in on what's important to them and you don't bore them with the things they are, that aren't important to them. Why make it personal? Because it solidifies an emotional connection with the brand. And customers that make that connection have up to three, uh, a 306% higher lifetime value and will re recommend you to others at a rate of 71%. Again, very low cost of acquisition on word of mouth advertising. Just remember that retention is a marathon and not a sprint. Customers gradually develop an emotional connection to a brand over time. That being said, most research shows that the most important time in a customer's journey is during onboarding. That sets the stage for retention success. Let's get practical. It's all about look, listen, and learn with every single customer interaction. Use tools like CRM to catalog what you learn about the customer. Also just ask the customer. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna tell you about how they intend to use the product or what had drawn them in for the inquiry in the first place. And finally, understand that no two customers are alike. And if you ask customers about them, they expect you to use that information for their benefit. Now we're gonna talk about understanding the customer journey, but building experiences. Um, you know, this is a heavily discussed topic in marketing these days, the, the whole concept of customer journeys. It seems like the modern marketer is obsessed with this concept of the customer journey. While customer journey mapping can be a valuable planning tool, they can also be overwhelming to small organizations. And the cost to develop mar marketing initiatives for every single phase of the customer journey can be cost prohibitive. Instead, what I encourage businesses to do is understand the customer journey at, a highest, at the highest level, but really focus in on building experience at the key points. And that means you have to understand how the customer uses your product and then translate that to key emotional points in the ownership. Identifying these experiences is done by looking at where your product features intersect with the customer needs. And note that may be different between your varying customer segments. You may have one customer segment that likes three or five of, of your features, the features of your product, and you may have another customer segment that focuses in on three to five different features. You'll, you'll need to be able to have strategies for each of those groups. Next, let's take a look at the CX pyramid and figure out where you land on it. 
the CX pyramid is really just another one of those pyramids that shows you the growth in this category. Stage one is the communication level. And really it's getting the customer information they can use via the right channel at the right time. Stage two is the responsive level. That means you're helping to solve customer problems quick, quickly and efficiency, uh, efficiently. Stage three is the commitment level. It's listen for, understand and resolve customers' unique problems. That, that takes you to that next level of being, being very personal in your interactions. Stage four is proactive. Basically, understanding the customer's needs before they even understand those needs and resolving those before they even ask. And then the fifth level is, is the panacea of it all, which is evolution level. And it's developing a customer experience that makes the customer feel better, safer, and more powerful. Let's get practical. Step one is to be honest with yourself and where you land on this CX pyramid. If you're not even on the pyramid, that's great. At least you are honest with yourself and you know where to start. If you're at step three, that's great too. You know where, where to begin. The step two on this is about making a goal to move just one level up. Set that goal and also a goal on when you'd like to accomplish that. And then step three, like all good processes, is once you've reached that success, you loop back to step two and set new goals. Next, let's talk about building experiences from the outside in. Uh, we'll talk about a common buzzword that I hear often, which is operational efficiency. Every business is focused on, uh, focused on operational efficiency. Effectively, it's a metric to measure efficiency, right? If you're an inside-focused organization, you focus on that operational efficiency. If you're an outside-focused organization, you focus on customer experience. One of the pitfalls of being inside-focused is that you may develop programs that don't resonate with customers and thus don't actually drive operational efficiency. But if you're an outside focus, if you're outside focused, you rarely develop programs that don't resonate with your customer. So as you start to build these retention programs and try to build relationships, focus on what the value proposition is to the consumer, not how it'll benefit your business. The reality is, if you benefit the customer, the customer will benefit you. Let's get practical. The reality is this is all about listening. Listen to the customer, listen to the customer, listen to the customer. You know, there's, and there's a variety of ways that you can listen to the customer. At Southeast Toyota Finance, we use a variety of products. We use products uh, to, to survey the customer. We use voice the customer products. We have tools that we can actually watch customers engage with our website and see where they come up with challenges. We look at web metrics to also look at those, uh, to look for those challenges. And we even talk to our call centers to find out what customers are saying on the, in, on the phone to better dictate what we do the, to make the customer experience better. At the end of the day, it's all about listening. In your business, that may just be calling the customer or asking the customer when they're in your, in your facility. Number six is focus on the customer needs. I think nobody said it better than Steve Jobs. You've got to start with a customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You cannot start with technology and try to figure out where you're going to sell it. And this is really important. Being customer focused equals being more profitable. Customer centric companies are 60% more profitable than companies that aren't. More importantly, being customer focused is what customers expect. In fact, in a recent survey, 76% of customers surveyed specifically stated they expect companies to understand their needs. And poor customer experience comes back to the cost of company. Accenture estimates the business, that the businesses lose $1.6 trillion a year due to poor customer experience. And even your loyal customers can lose confidence and defect to a competitor that better satisfies their needs if you're not continually monitoring your customer-focused initiatives. Let's get practical. Ask the customer why they purchased. Listen to what they say, and more importantly, document, and then respond and reinforce using what you've learned. And this is really important. Ask, listen, document, respond. That should be a consistent cycle in your business. Because they, if you ask, they will tell you what their motivations are. 
And seven, it, it really is keep it simple and just get started. It's important to keep it simple. I know most of the people here are have small businesses and thinking about tackling something like retention can be daunting, but it, it can be very simple. It can be as simple as making a phone call after the purchase. It can be as simple as creating a document that is specific to your cust a customer segment that goes along with the purchase that helps them get maximum value as quickly as possible. If you overcomplicate it, the process won't stick. It may, be, may seem daunting, but it starts with taking one step. Continue to spend on customer acquisition. It's the fuel that feeds your business. Retention is about optimizing that fuel. It's about giving retention more focus and small spends with high returns. And there is no better investment than in onboarding. And that's generally considered 30 to 45 days unless you have a very short consumption, consumption cycle for your products. Let's get practical. Here are some of the simple steps to get you started. Customer retention is about building a relationship and building a relationship with a business is the same as establishing a, establishing a personal connection. The premise of customer retention is to build trust and make them feel comfortable with the brand while enabling the customer to be loyal to you and your brand. It's about you being you. It's also about you sharing your knowledge and finding ways to enhance their experience. Even if you sell a price sensitive product, some steps in customer experience can be a competitive advantage for you. Get practical. Number one, decide that retention is important to your business. Define both a short-term and long-term vision and make it realistic. Don't shoot for the moon because you're not going to make it in the first step. Communicate not just the vision, but its importance throughout your organization. Change is tough. Get hands-on with the implementation and reinforcing your vision on a regular basis throughout your organization. It's it, it may feel like a half step back when you first start and customers and your associates may need a nudge to continue down the process. The final thing is the process is never over. When you meet your goal, it really is rinse, repeat. Take a look at where you are. What's the next, next step that you can go through and, and make that goal. At Southeast Toyota Finance, we implement new customer initiatives every month. We focus on an agile approach. And the next month, we look at the next set things up, set those at goal, as goals and implement those, assuming that we were able to accomplish the route to, to get. That's really all I had today. And so I'd like to open it up for some questions, if there are any. Perfect. Um, Jane Moore asked in the Q&A, what CRM system do you recommend for a small business? And a CRM is a customer relationship management software. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's one specific. I, when I think of CRM, I don't necessarily even think of vendor, right? There, there are the big ones, Salesforce. There is uh, Sugar CRM that's out there, which is less expensive. Even if it's something like QuickBooks, anything that you can keep track of your consumers, take notes. Um, the biggest thing is find a way to keep notes on the feedback that you got from the consumer in a consistent way. And then when you plan additional interactions with them, whether those are digital interactions or personal interactions, leverage that information accordingly. Perfect. I wanna, um, first of all, invite folks to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, and thank you for that question, um, uh, uh, Jane. I wanted to take a minute and talk about how some of this advice changes when you go from a large, well-known brand like Toyota to some of the smaller and mid-sized companies where you've worked. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, number one at scale, right? Like uh, at Toyota, we have more resources, although not as many as most people would expect. We have resources to, to leverage. We have technology to leverage. Some of this is really simple, right? Um, even when you think of, um, email communications, right? You Sorry, I think I muted you by mistake. I was trying to get you to stop sharing your screen so we can see you full screen. Oh, sure. <laughs> I apologize. I just, uh, I just mansplained, I think. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so I, I think it's about scale, right? When 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 I we look at what we do at Toyota, we have um, 
access to more sophisticated solutions. We have access to more um, capital to invest. But this really should scale fairly well. Meaning, you know, if you're sending out email blasts, you've got an email, you've got an email platform. So setting up an email that you send out to consumers um, at a timed interval after they've made a purchase, it is not a heavy investment because you, if you're sending email blasts out already, you've got that platform in place. It's simply understanding that customer segment and then taking the added time to invest a little bit of energy post-purchase. If you don't have email platforms, it could be as something as simple as including a flyer in, in with the purchase that identifies a couple of key benefits for the product or a couple of key ways that would enhance the customer's experience with that product. That is simple copier work, right? So I think that's how you scale it. People get overwhelmed and think, oh, well, I can't do this because you know this, this guy's from Toyota. I can tell you I've worked with small businesses, mid-sized businesses, all the way up to companies like Toyota. The concepts are scalable. Uh, how you execute uh, differs, but the concept is really all about being customer focused and putting that customer hat on when you start to think about things. I'll give you a good example. There are a variety of companies that um, I've worked with that challenged me on putting a, a phone number on every page of their website, right? Or uh, I've, I've had a company challenge me about the concept of opening, opening up online chat. If a consumer, if that's the way the, that a consumer wants to contact you, why would you hide your phone number on your website? If you're saying, well, my business can't handle that and that's not sustainable for me, well, you have a big business problem there because you have narrowed your ability for the consumer to interact with you. Um, and, and I think those are the kind of things that you have to start to look at. When you put the customer's hat in mind, um, you know, put, put the customer's hat on, you wanna make yourself as easy to, to contact as possible. If you can't take the, that volume of phone calls, then get a ticket management solution in place and open up email. Just make sure that you're responding to those emails in a timely manner. So there's a variety of different ways to scale this to the size of your business, but it's all about being customer focused. You know, it's interesting because one really contrasting example of, of this in place is Zappos, which is famous for its customer retention, famous for its customer um, treatment. Customer, Zappos sells shoes online. They were acquired by Amazon. Uh, who also is really well known for its customer obsession is what they call it. But they approach it really differently. Uh, Zappos makes its phone front and center and it really tries to get people to call them. Amazon really focuses on kind of the one click experience, more of a technological solution. And frankly, good luck if you want to talk to a human being there. Uh, they really don't want that. Um, and both seem to work. Both seem to work. But I'm curious if you have a perspective there. I, I personally am more aligned with Zappos, which is if you put your phone and they call you and they tell you about something that's not working right, and then you learn from that and incorporate that and improve the product so that the next time around they don't have that question, I think you've just gotten really valuable feedback and created a lifelong customer. Whereas I think most businesses, you know, don't have the technological prowess to be able to create that seamless customer experience online. But I, I'm very interested in, in your thoughts about this. I, I think there's a lot of conflicting best practices here. You, you see a lot of e-commerce companies that hide uh, and don't want people to call. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you my perspective. My perspective is that um, it, it, you'll kind of see this um, thread of thought throughout the presentation, but not every one customer is the same. Um, at Southeast Toyota Finance, we support a variety of consumers, right? We have cons older consumers that aren't comfortable with technology. We have newer consumers that are, are comfortable to with technology. So I think the optimal solution is having the chan all channels available so that if a consumer wants to interact with a given channel, it's available to them. 
The counterpoint to that is if your business just can't scale to that, and, and I don't know the details of Amazon's structure and why they've chosen that. I have done um, the Zappos tour and spent some time out in Las Vegas to really understand their customer centric focus. But what I would tell you is that if, you, if your business can't support multi-channel capability, then you better be damn good at the channel that you're in, which means if I get a customer, if I'm only gonna take customer feedback or customer interactions via email, then on my site or in my emails, I'm gonna set expectations and I'm gonna do everything I can to meet that expectation. And if that's that I'm gonna respond in 12 hours or less, then, then I'm gonna probably surprise and delight by making it my goal internally to be eight hours or less. But, but I'm gonna make sure that I do everything possible to meet that expectation. Um, I think that's where it's at. I, ideally, I think we all have to understand that customers are comfortable with different platforms. There is a segment of the cu customers that would like to, I mean, we, we interact with people in our own real life that would rather text you than talk to you on the phone. But then my mother would rather talk to me on the phone than ever get a text. So I think that's the practicality of being a truly customer focused business is that's what you should aspire to. But I also know the reality is that not every business can do, can support all those things, but what channel you do support, you better invest to make sure you can deliver on the expectation. So Ross can uh, said, it seems that customer retention is as much a mindset as an actual set of specific strategies. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think there are certainly strategies that you can take to take the first step. But if you're not invested, right? If, 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 and this goes to the top of the organization, if your organization doesn't believe that the customer is the lifeblood of your business, and a lot of people will say that, but their behaviors won't really, you know, won't really tell the same story. If you're not truly invested in trying to make the customer the central focus of your activities, then you're, you're, you know, you're not gonna be successful at this. At the same time, I think, you know, we focus on the, you know, the, the pocket of business that we have the capability to influence and we try to be as customer focused as we can. And I'll tell you, we're not perfect. There are things that, we, that I would like to do that we just haven't been able to get to yet. Um, I've been with the organization a little over four years now. Our roadmap is as long as it could possibly be. So I'm not here to tell you that we have everything perfect. Uh, I do think that philosophically, we measure everything through the, pit, the prism of, is it good for the customer? And then look at what the benefits to the business are. And obviously that has to be balanced. I can't do something that's holistically good for the customer, but doesn't generate any value for me, right? I could give everybody free cars and every customer would be happy, but that would do nothing for my business. But I think the principle is, measuring everything through the prism of, is this good for the customer first? And then say, okay, well now what's the benefit of the business? And you'll oftentimes find that using that strategy will align most of your interactions in a way that you can be very profitable in your approach. Absolutely, and really what we're playing at here is to try to get recurring customers, right? To get people to buy and then buy again. And so while it might cost a little bit more uh, on that first sale, uh, the benefit is the referrals and the recurring purchases. Um, I wanted to uh, ask a question from Adam Lopez. He said, there's an old adage that if you try to make everyone happy, you'll make no one happy. So how do you prioritize your customer-centric focus? I think what he's asking is, how do you know which customers to make happy? Can, you can't make them all happy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, in large organizations like, like ours, we look at volume, right? There is, you're never going to make everybody happy. There's going to be that one person who calls in that doesn't like the color of your button. Um, we, we've had people call in. Um, we've had, we've had a, a, a customer send us a letter that tell us they don't like the images that we use on our emails. And they made a big fuss about that, right? Th those onesie, twosie guys aren't people that you can really focus on. And, and honestly, um, if you start to listen to your customers and sort of uh, segment those, the feedback into clusters, you'll see large clusters that allow you to focus on the things that are most important. Um, when I talk about like developing a customer journey, 
uh, one of the things that we're working on now is using net promoter score uh, to both on a regular basis to measure, we want to be able to measure what the customer's net promoter score is in regular intervals, and then also measure net promoter score at key interactions. I Remind folks what net promoter score is. So net promoter score is basically a way to, custom, to measure customer satisfaction. It's a simple question. Um, uh, would you recommend uh, this company to your friends or family? And it's measured on a scale of one to 10. So the way that we look at, we're trying to get to is get a regular cadence of that measure to understand just the natural net promoter score of a customer. And then measure it again when we have key interactions and watch where that net promoter score moves. And based on how that net promoter score moves, if you look at it in a holistic perspective, if you see a natural depression for a, a lot of customers dipping in that experience, then that's an experience that you need to work on. So I think there are things like that. Now, obviously that's a more complex approach um, for small businesses. It's if you hear a lot of the same complaint, guess what, that's, that's probably an area that you, that you need to work on. Um, for medium and large size, size businesses, things like customer surveys, CSAT, or customer satisfaction, net promoter score are all ways um, to get an idea of what the customer is thinking. But I think how you implement those programs is more important than just having them. Yeah, the first step is to get some sort of customer satisfaction or customer survey. But you also have to have a strategy on figuring out um, how that customer satisfaction metrics uh, moves throughout the life cycle of the customer and what interactions cause it to increase and what interactions cause it to, to decrease. You know, with, with BizHack, we um, pride ourselves on a great customer experience. Uh, you know, we call that the onboarding process. In fact, just this week as a team, we've been having conversations about adjusting uh, you know, our onboarding process, because we're seeing a lot of folks, including some of the people who are here on today's call, um, are having some challenges with the technical onboarding, and that maybe we could add some optional pre-course um, offerings to help people with the technical onboarding before the first day of class. And we also... So, so this is like a very live conversation for us. That's a, a commitment, obviously, of, of time and resources, but one that we think will uh, result in uh, a much better experience for our, our, our participants. The other one is around the frequency of communication and how we communicate. Um, and, you know, we have actually tried to reduce the amount of email that we send because we think it's annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've gone from kind of more frequent reminders to now just at the beginning of every week, we do one big email with all the information in one convenient place to build a habit that our participants know they'll get that email and it'll lay out the entire week for them in a really easy to see way. And we feel like that's, that's a better customer experience. And we've moved a lot of the more transactional emails into WhatsApp. Um, so anyway, we, we are, and, you know, we've been doing this for seven years and these are not small changes. Like we're, we're kind of constantly looking for ways to do better. Um, and I imagine Patrick that you've had similar experiences at Toyota and your other jobs. And I'm curious, can you give a specific example of a seemingly small adjustment to the customer onboarding or customer experience that had yielded big results for you? Uh, sure. Yeah. So before I was at Southeast Toyota Finance, I oversaw uh, the marketing um, and actual customer service. The call center rolled up to me for a software as a service product. And before I took over, before I took over, they were onboarding completely and holistically with emails. So generic emails, um, to your point, uh, pretty aggressive. Um, and, and what we did was we changed over to a completely different approach uh, where we, we certainly tailored the, the email communications to come out, but make sure that they were timely and valuable to the customer and then tailed those off after a certain period of time. I always like to say 
for long purposes that have a, a long life cycle, like a year or longer, that first 30 days is the most valuable, right? And the, the faster that you can generate time to value, the more, the more that, that's the most important window, that first 30 days. So if you think about consistent communication in the first, let's say 10 to 15 days, and then start to tailor those communications off after that, and then just have longer distances between your communications after you break the 30 day window, as long as those communications add value in the onboarding experiences, the customer is okay. The other thing that we did was we switched our models so that some of those interactions were actual phone calls from CSR agents. So they would come, they would make a phone call three days after a customer signed up for the software as a service product and said, Hey, I'm going to be your dedicated resource. Um, do you have any questions? And if you don't have any questions, that's fine. I'm going to, I'll call you 10 days later and I'll follow up with you um, to make sure you have questions. So we invested three outbound phone calls for every onboarding. Now, obviously that was a complete, complete change to the business model. And that's how I ended up with a call center rolling up under me, but that was a dramatic change. And what we found was that it was, it, it goes back to that creating a personal experience, right? If Bob Smith is on the phone and he makes that call two days after you make the purchase. And he then makes another call 10 days later and another call 10 days after that. And it's Bob who sends you the emails. Uh, you start to create a relationship with Bob. And if you call in and you have a problem and Bob's the guy that answer the phone, the likelihood that you're going to sign up for that second month and the third month and the fourth month becomes dramatically increased because you've created that relationship. Now that doesn't apply to every business because software as a service is a little bit different. But I think if you look at it in the context of businesses in general, it, it still plays a role. Figure out as a business how you can make it more personal. And, and that personal touch is what's going to engender you with a customer better and strengthen your retention rates. What do you feel, uh... There, there's obviously a debate between phone versus other types of communication. And um, what is your perspective on that, Patrick? Um, my, my assumption is that phone is more expensive, um, is. But, but more effective as well. So the, sort of the way we looked at this, um, and, and I talk about this at Southeast Toyota Finance. I don't have the call center, it doesn't roll up to me, but we do integrate with them um, and interact with them on a regular basis. So we talk about this a lot. I believe if you can support it, you should support all channels. That means email, phone, and chat. Um, you would be surprised at, and, and, and you can strategically drive customers to the more cost-efficient channels through your phone. So if you're smart about the way you implement phone and you've got self-service capabilities on the web, your phone agents can drive them to self-service and you'll be surprised how many people will pick that up. The reality is, if you look at the research, most people don't want to call a company. The reason they do is because the channels, the other channels the company make of, makes available are either not easy to find or not easy to navigate. So if you have easily navigable self-service capabilities, whether that's email or online chat, even when you get a phone call, if your agents do something as simple as say, hey, by the way, did you know that we can provide 24-7 support for you via our um, chat or secure messaging or our web platforms, uh, what you'll see is a lot of those customers will be attracted to that because A, they can do it on their own time. B, a lot of people just don't like to talk to human beings. One of the projects that we implemented last year as a pilot was a, a web platform to support customers in collections. You want to talk, and, and, and some of the people on the phone are probably thinking, why in the world is somebody in marketing even thinking about collections? Well, number one, I think every customer, whether they're in good standing or bad standing, is still a customer, and we need to figure out how to best support them in the situation that they're in. But what we found in that platform was we opened our secure messaging platform up to those customers, and we found the customers that inter interacted with that platform were substantially more likely to cure than the customers that we were chasing down on the phone. And so I, I think that's indicative of the fact that if you open these new channels up, customers are just waiting for them. You think it's going to cost you more, but it actually costs you less in the long run. 
Um, we have a few more minutes for questions before we wrap up. So if anybody does have one, I welcome you to use the Q&A. Uh, Patrick, I really appreciate uh, all uh, the, the, the advice that you're giving. I want to talk about live chat for a second. It's become very popular and it's very relatively inexpensive. Uh, but it also, I think, sometimes creates a promise that not every company can deliver on, which is of immediate return turnaround. Um, whereas with email, for instance, I think there's more of an expectation of within a few hours. Uh, you know, like with a phone, I feel like with chat, if you don't get an immediate response, you're not going to be very happy. So I wonder when you're dealing with micro enterprises and really small businesses, um, that are maybe considering or even have a chat function on their website, um, how they should think about um, response times and staffing that chat. Yeah, I think, look, so there's this, there's really two topics around this. The two hot topics right now are, are, are online chat, real-time chat, and chat bots. Um, and, and we've had, I've, even at Toyota, I've had people come and say, well, we should do a chat bot. And the reality is, you need to do chat great before you try to do chat bot because you'll do more damage with a chat bot than you could ever do with chat or not having anything at all. Um, and just, just, for those, just for those who aren't familiar, a chat bot is like a phone tree, but with chat. So it's like press one for English, two for Spanish. It's, it's that um, automated set of responses that kind of bring you uh, down uh, to either getting your answer or connecting with a live human being. And it's usually um, what, what Patrick's referring to is if you don't have that automation really well designed, it can be really annoying and turn people off. Yeah, so, so here's my recommendation on chat is um, just like any channel, uh, it set expectations. So I have a physician that I work with in Costa Rica, we set up chat for them. Um, and, and the way we set it up was that it was, was not even available when a customer, when a customer success agent wasn't there. So, and, and that is, those expectations are set. So if there's nobody live uh, that can answer the question, then the, the chat function isn't even available. For small businesses, that would be the approach that I, that I take because there's nothing worse than somebody thinking they're gonna get a real-time response and then not. So A, yes, you gotta have the, you have to invest a resource that can respond to that. Chat does not need to be 24 seven though. If you only have a six hour window, somebody that can handle six hours, a six hour window, then you set that expectation to the customer and you just meet that expectation. But you have to be realistic with yourself and know your business and know whether or not um, you can meet those expectations. But I think, I think there are certainly ways to implement chat uh, that are, can be successful for a small business. Many of the tools today have phone apps where you can literally respond to the, the chat anywhere you are. Um, I think it's getting the right tool and setting the right expectations. I think there was a question about... Uh, when to roll a new channel, and it specifically talked about social. Yeah, exactly. Carrie McKieran had asked, what is the tipping point that triggers opening up a new channel, especially social media, as new platforms pop up all the time and some stick and others fizzle out? So probably the worst person to ask about social media. I don't, have, I don't put a, a great value in it, especially on a customer support perspective. You know, I worked in an agency 10 years ago and our primary focus was on physicians and every one of them wanted to be on Facebook and uh, they all wanted to put coupons and out there. And in my mind, I don't incentivize the people I already have relationships with, right? My relationships should strengthen, should be strong and they should want to continue to business with me. If I have to incentivize you, then I don't, haven't really retained you from a financial perspective. From a customer support perspective, uh, I think social media is a slippery slope because if you can invest the time, invest the time, effort, and energy into it, and we're challenged with this on for, with Toyota, uh, that rolls up under our call center. Um, due to the legal reasons, we have to be very careful about what we say on there, and so we see a lot of people with complaints, and we have to respond to those uh, via direct messaging. So, 
I, I think it, it, you have to know your business and you have to be able to respond. With social media, you have to be uber timely because what we see is an, am, an avalanche of negativity, right? If you don't respond quickly, then somebody else is going to feed on that negativity and then somebody else will feed on that negativity. And now all of a sudden, especially if you're not um, engaged in other social media activities like post regular posting, all your social uh, dashboard looks like is a big negative stream. So I think that's the one that I would be mo most cautious of because it's got such visibility. I think the other channels all, all become about, hey, how can I best support these? And what are my customers asking for, right? You'll know if your customers, all your customers call up frustrated and the first thing they say is, I can't get a hold of you via email, then you probably need to shift some effort on email because that's really how they want to get a hold of you. Or they call up and say, I really wish you, you know, you had chat. I think that's another really good example of, hey, if you get enough of those, it's probably time to start looking about looking at how you can support that from a business perspective. The reality is we all are living a nine to five world. So if your business is running nine to five and your customers are run, running nine to five, it's very difficult for them to get in contact with you. So you need to figure a way out to support in those ancillary hours. And, and I think that's where the focus should be. And those digital channels like self-service, email, secure messaging, the non-real-time stuff are where you can support those off hours in a meaningful way. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of support, as you mentioned, going on uh, and customer complaints coming through places like Instagram and certainly Twitter. Um, and, you know, you do as a business need to monitor those um, because it's going to be said whether you are paying attention to it or not. And it does have a potential to snowball, but it also is really hard from a resource perspective. Um, last quick question is about customer reviews um, as a customer experience channel. Um, how do you, Patrick, think about reviews um, and review management as it relates to your work? Yeah, we don't, we don't do a lot with reviews just because we're at such a high level. I mean, we do monitor all those things. We've got monitoring tools for all the social channels. I think with some of the work, consulting work that I do, my recommendation on reviews has always been um, to try to respond, if possible, for both positive and negative reviews, right? Um, as an organization, your ability to say, hey, maybe we messed up, but come back and give us a sh another shot right, in a public forum can do as much positive, can have as much positive impact, um, you know, as the initial complaint or negative review may have been negative, uh, had a negative impact. So I think getting out there and, you know, you see it, all, you're starting to see it a lot where companies go out and when they get a positive review, they say thank you, right? Graciousness is not limited to just us regular human beings. You can be a gracious organization and say thank you for the positive review. And then I think if, if it's within your, the ethos of the organization, respond to negative reviews in an open manner and, and, and try, to, try to resolve the situation. There are going to be some customers out there who, who just are belligerent and you can't solve that problem. But I think a lot, most people out there can see if you take a, a concerted effort to try to solve a customer's issue, they're going to see that, and 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 that can have a really positive impact. Yeah, this is important advice, which is don't ignore negative reviews, even though you think you want to. It's uh, it's better to deal with them head on, uh, and try to use it as a jujitsu move. Try to turn the negative into a positive. Try to turn the detractor into a raving fan. Um, one last minute question before we wrap up uh, from Andre. Uh, he asked, "Do you build a customer profile?" I'm going to adjust that a little bit. Um, you know, we talk a lot about audience targeting and identifying different audience personas in terms of your potential customer. Do you have an audience um, segmentation of your existing customers that you've built and that you service differently based on their persona? Um, I don't. So I would say that in our development cycle, we are not slicing and dicing by persona. We're about two years into a long term development program. Um, and we've laid a lot of the foundation to do that. Uh, obviously my job in, in this organization 
is mostly focused on digital, which means I basically own the, the sales, Southeast Toyota Finance uh, servicing platform. And so we built the capability to slice and dice in uh, personas or subsegments. And I think if you look at our strategy, the way we're kind of looking at it today is um, we built the capability. Our next step is to be able to segment. And then our next step is to take that next um, evolution and go to the persona level. So we're working towards that approach. I think um, I always try to say, we're trying to build a, a level set of all the tools and capabilities, and then we'll start to segment to get more personal, and then we'll get down to the persona level to even get more personal. But, but we do do um, some very one-to-one -one focused initiatives where we're sending, like we have an offer program where we send us a, a unique offer on a unique vehicle to a unique customer that takes into account just the information that we know about them. So that's our sort of long-term nirvana that we'd like to get to on all of our platforms, but we've had to do a lot of work to start to lay the, the foundation to get there. Yeah, and I mean, you can imagine if Toyota is having, uh, you know, it's a multi-year process with resource issues. If you're a smaller business, doing that kind of segmentation is difficult. I, I think probably if you're going to segment your existing customers around customer experience, probably you could think about it in terms of their behaviors. These are people who like to communicate via email. These are people who like to be communicating via phone and just kind of keep it at that. I don't think you need to overcomplicate it. I think in the end, it's just about a human to human connection, right? If you res are responsive and do your best to solve their issues and when possible, go out of your way to help them, that will uh, do the trick. It'll cement loyalty and it'll make them more likely to tell their friends. Patrick, I wanna thank you so much for a fabulous presentation. Um, and I'll just say a few quick words before we wrap up, but thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. So next month's Safima sponsored uh, presentation is on Clubhouse. We're gonna talk about the hottest new social media platform with Dennis Yu. Thank you to Safima for co-sponsoring that. We have a number of great sessions on LinkedIn um, and uh, lessons from being a CMO as well. I also wanted to announce, uh, we've been getting a lot of requests uh, from folks about one-on-one -on -one coaching um, and whether we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching packages. And I wanted to um, just share with you a quick announcement. Uh, thanks guys for, for sticking around for this. Um, studies have shown, and this is Google data, that it's one-on-one -on -one coaching actually rather than superior technical knowledge that is the number one key to personal development. And this is something that we've seen in our own work. The one-on-one -on -one component to all of our programs, which personalizes your learning to your specific business needs is really where we see the biggest advancements and jumps uh, in our participants. Uh, and we have uh, an incredible group of uh, marketing coaches that um, w work with businesses that are part of our program and outside of our program. And so we're introducing now uh, an opportunity for folks in our community to purchase one-on-one -on -one coaching with a BizHack marketing coach. These coaching sessions um, are included um, in the full program that we offer, but we now have uh, enough demand and a large enough base of certified coaches that we can actually offer this coaching if you just have some specific issues that you're struggling with. Um, this is a new product and just email me at dgretch at bizhack.com if you're interested um, in three, six or 12 sessions. Um, I wanna thank you all for uh, another amazing session. Again, thank you, Patrick. And uh, join us for next week um, and uh, hopefully uh, join us for one-on-one -on -one coaching or our Digital Marketers Edge program, which starts on March 22nd. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. And thanks again, Patrick.